The murder trial involving an undocumented immigrant who was charged with shooting and killing Kate Steinle has been acquitted. The man who was charged has been acquitted, which uh, was, to be quite honest with you, a, a rather shocking verdict. Now, this became a national story after it was uh, uh, referenced by Donald Trump, who was then a candidate, and it led to the comments that he made uh, about uh, Mexican individuals who had come into the United States, referring to them as criminals and rapists. Now, uh, let me give you uh, the rundown of the case and how this verdict came to be. Now, after deliberations that began on November 21st, Garcia Zarata, uh, Zarate, uh, that was the uh, undocumented immigrant, a Mexican citizen was found not guilty of murder. Now, I want to stop for a second because remember, when it comes to uh, a murder trial, there is an incredibly high burden of proof, okay? Uh, and it is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So you have to understand the burden of proof before you uh, kind of dig into why it is that verdicts turn out the way that they do. No, uh, let, let me just pause there for a second. Now, of course, in, in all criminal cases, you need beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, but juries uh, take murder, and rightfully so, a little bit more seriously as well on top of that. Look, if we're gonna give this guy uh, life uh, in prison, uh, we gotta be absolutely sure. And the, in a civil trial, you just need a preponderance of the evidence. So the, the way that they explain it to the jurors in some cases is, if you're 51% sure he did it, then in a civil trial, you vote rule for that guy instead of that person, right? In a criminal case, you have to be 99% sure. And as you're gonna see here, sometimes it's a little hard to be 99% sure. Mm -hmm. and, and these are, of course, rough explanations of how beyond a reasonable doubt works. Um, and in the case of, of uh, Zarate's lawyer, Matt Gonzalez, he said, of the people criticizing this uh, verdict, you have this quote. Yeah, I'm gonna then get I'll to that. save it. I'll yeah, save it. Yeah, because I think that his quote was um, interesting and kind of puts things in perspective. But we'll get to that in just a second. I want to get to his charges first. So as I mentioned, uh, he was uh, charged with murder, but he also had lesser charges, uh, including involuntary manslaughter and assault with a deadly weapon. He was convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm, which carries a sentence up to three years. What happened? How did this uh, case come about? Steinle was shot in the back uh, as she and her father strolled along Pier 14 in San Francisco on July 1st, 2015. Jose Inez Garcia Zarate, who was charged with killing Steinle, had been released from jail even though federal immigration authorities had sought to detain him. Uh, now this brought up the issue of so-called sanctuary cities uh, and you know no one knew or had heard of sanctuary cities until this case became a national headline and you know People think sanctuary cities just mean that the city or the state uh, protects undocumented immigrants, but it actually has to do with a fight over resources because federal authorities or ICE officials will ask local authorities to detain an individual indefinitely and that costs money and sometimes it'll take years for the federal officials to get to that case. And so uh, in, in sanctuary cities, they're saying, no, uh, we're not gonna go ahead and hold someone indefinitely. That drains our resources, we have overcrowded prisons, you guys get the point, or overcrowded jails. Now, on April 15th, 2015, two and a half months before Steinle's death, Garcia Zarate was released from the San Francisco County Jail, where he was being held on a marijuana charge, despite a request from federal authorities that he be held for a sixth deportation. And that's another thing to keep in mind. He had been deported five times previously, and he managed to find a way back into the United States. He used different names. Names. Yeah, he used different names. And so, you know, if you want to have a debate or a discussion about border security, I think that that's a fair discussion to have in regard to this case. Garcia Zarate uh, signed a confession during a police interrogation, and defense lawyers took issue with its validity and the circumstances under which it was obtained. So, this is where the story takes a turn or a twist because uh, the confession was apparently uh, obtained in a way that calls into question the interrogation methods and whether or not it was a credible confession. Confession. So the defense lawyers uh, elicited an admission from police that they lied to Garcia Zarate in order to get a truthful response, telling him that they had recovered the weapon when they had not, and that there was DNA, a DNA match that implicated him, which there wasn't at the time. So the interrogators are telling him these things to try to get a confession. Um, they essentially lied to him to get the confession. And yeah. Boy, I got a lot of mixed feelings about this case. Mm -hmm. And some of my opinions here will be progressive and some will be conservative. Uh, so uh, first on the interrogation, 
don't care that they lied to him. They're allowed to lie to him, uh, and that's prosecution 101. So uh, now, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of a shocking number of false confessions, which um, when I read the stats on it, I was kind of blown away by. So that gives me a little bit more pause. And I used to, and to be fair, I worked at a couple of prosecutors' office, so I will, that's my perspective to some degree. It's just as an intern when I was in law school, but and I thought about being a prosecutor. But yes, you by law, I want you to be clear on this. You are definitely allowed to lie to people uh, when you're interrogating them to get what you what we hope is a truthful confession, right? So sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. You remember the Central Park Five confessed, and it turned out they hadn't done it at all. Uh, and it's because they were kept under severe conditions and, and uh, unduly pressured. In this case, that's just lying to them, uh, to me, is not an extreme condition at all. Sanctuary cities. Look, if Republicans say, don't let the like guys like this go if the federal government wants them. And the federal government in this case had said, hey, San Francisco, don't let them go. We want to come get them. Then you have to provide funding mm -hmm. to keep them in prison all that time, right? Or in some sort of detention. So right now, everybody say, "Oh no, no, they sh you shouldn't let them go." Okay, are you going to fund it? No, I don't care. Uh, they let them deal with it. No, that doesn't make any sense. That's an unfunded mandate. So that is the beginning of the conversation. So if they had funded it, should they keep guys like that in prison? And I, some progressives will disagree with me, but I think yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now they. The, on the other hand, the right wing makes this guy seem like he'd already murdered 17 people, and San Francisco is a sanctuary city. So, they're like, let's coddle him and give him a hug on his way out. No, the the, the other offenses were all nonviolent. Marijuana, marijuana, and things along those lines. Uh, all nonviolent. Now, it doesn't mean they should have let him go. But on the other hand, you got to provide funding, as we discussed. And it makes it seem like Obama and the Democrats were like. Let him go and then have him, they deported him and then have him come back in. Oh, it's Zarate, hey, good to see you again, welcome home. No, he he used different names, etc. Now you wanna say that's an argument for the wall? I hear you, brother, okay, I have other arguments against the wall. But so, um, and then finally, when you get to reasonable doubt, we haven't gotten into those details yet, but I probably would have convicted him. That's easy to say sitting here and not being on the jury. Mm -hmm. uh, but I understand why they thought there was reasonable doubt as, as Anna's gonna describe the details in a second. Right, so um, well first of all, in the confession video, uh, Zarate himself changes his story several times. Um, and so I think that calls into question what's going on. There's also the issue of uh, the weapon itself and whether or not he intended to shoot her or if it got shot accidentally. So let me give you uh, the argument from the defense and then um, Steph actually has some really interesting information in regard to the weapon um, that they found. So the defense said that Garcia Zarate found the gun wrapped in a cloth on the pier and that it discharged accidentally as he held it with the bullet ricocheting off the concrete before striking Stanley. Now remember, murder means that it's premeditated. It means that that individual intended to shoot and kill someone. And so it is up to the prosecutors to prove that. And so in this case, um, the, the, the weapon found is actually very relevant. And Steph, jump in because you had some interesting information about that. Well, the other thing I just wanted to chime in for a moment here and mention this, the jury had a fundamental question to answer, and that was whether this was intentional. And that's right. why you and you have murder or involuntary manslaughter or second degree murder. That's okay. So the issue is the uh, the gun here. It's the, a Sig Sauer P239. It's a semi-automatic pistol. All right. So uh, a forensics expert had uh, testified during this trial that it has no safety switch and the weapon has a trigger. Uh, that requires a little, just little force to actually pull. Right. So that, that just speaks to, to, to the weapon itself. The other issue is that the bullet ricocheted mm -hmm. and traveled 80 feet before it hit Steinle. And that's, uh, the, the medical examiner said that the wounds that Steinle had sustained as a result of this shooting are consistent with the bullet ricocheting. In so, essence, proving that he didn't intend yeah. so to shoot her. Yeah, so let's keep, continue to break it down. So the defense says, he saw this gun that was wrapped in a cloth, I think, mm -hmm. picked it up, it went off accidentally, and then he threw it in the water afterwards because he was scared by the noise. That part I don't believe at all. I think he threw it in the water because he's like, oh my God, somebody just got shot, and he threw the gun away so that he couldn't have it as evidence, okay? So that's my outside interpretation. So in terms of murder, that's a clear cut not guilty. I mean, like the 
the conservatives in the press make it seem like he wanted he this is a guy who had killed many like it was a massively violent guy who likes to come back in the country and kill people and he went and shot Stanley in the back. No, he for however he did it, whether he intended to pull the trigger or it was by accident, he the trigger got pulled, it ricocheted off and and hit her. So that is not intentional murder. No way. On the other hand, I would have convicted him on involuntary manslaughter. I don't care how it ricocheted off. Yeah. Don't pick up the gun. I don't know why you have the gun and I don't really care. Don't pick it up and then it won't go off. This is what we talk about with guns all the time. Yes, they do kill people, mm -hmm. just like they killed Steinley in this case. So whether he intended to shoot it, but in a different direction, one of the excuses he used was he was trying to shoot at the seals yeah. that are in the pier. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of seals in the pier, but shooting at them is not a good thing either. Mm -hmm. And when you shoot at a seal and it ricochets and hits a person and kills them, that's involuntary manslaughter. So I would have convicted on that. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I Look, we didn't sit on the jury, so we don't know all the evidence that was presented. Um, so I wanna make sure I preface what I'm about to say with that. However, based on what we do know, I do find it surprising that they did not find him guilty of invo involuntary manslaughter. Uh, but you know, again, we didn't hear all the evidence. Well, one last thing, the jury asked, and this goes partly to what Steph was saying. The jury asked, can we see a gun like that and have a demonstration to see if it does accidentally go off? And the judge said, no, you're not allowed to, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, then they must have had reasonable doubt because they're like, well, I, we can't tell if it goes off easily or not. My point if I was in that jury would have been, who cares? Don't pick up the gun and if you do, it could go off. Well, right? The other thing is that they couldn't tie him. So that gun was stolen. So they couldn't definitively say, not even the prosecution could argue that he stole that weapon mm -hmm. and then left and then shot Steinle, so. Yeah, and then uh, one final thing I wanted to quickly bring up was uh, Trump's reaction to this. Because remember, this became a very political uh, part of the campaign, and uh, he immediately sounded off on Twitter, which is unsurprising, and said the following. The Kate Steinle killer came back and back over the uh, weekly protected Obama border, always committing crimes and being violent, and yet this info was not used in court. His exoneration is a complete travesty of justice. Build the wall. Okay, I just wanna quickly mention um, how weak Obama was on, on border security. Um, he spent a considerable amount of funding on uh, border security. In fact, during his uh, first part of his administration, he hired 40,000 uh, individuals to protect the border. So uh, Obama actually did a ton of deportations. He was not weak on uh, border security, but it is a Republican talking point that you hear time and time again. So again, Trump says in the tweet that this guy was committed many violent acts. That's not true. Uh, it doesn't matter. I wouldn't have, you know, if we could have stopped him, everybody, if a border agent knew that it was Zarate and had no, knew that he was board, uh, deported five times, you think he, they wouldn't have deported him? They, that they would have let him in the country? No, they wouldn't have done that. There was no, and in fact, Obama broke the record on deportations when he was president. They called so, him the deporter in chief. The yeah. deporter in chief. So this nonsense about the Obama border is ridiculous. Do some people manage to sneak in anyway and commit crimes? Yes, that happens. And by the way, it will also happen under Trump. That doesn't mean it's Trump's border and he's not doing anything. You just watched the video by the Young Turks, home of the revolution. If you'd like to get a lot more than that, get the full show by becoming a member. TYTnetwork.com slash join.